Well, friend, we've reached the end of Paul Levine's message from 40 years ago that still rings true today. The message is on the dangers of incomplete obedience, and today he's going to press the point home in the finale, asking you to obey God all the way. Don't go halfway. Don't give God incomplete obedience. Let me encourage you to listen intently with a soft heart and open ears as Dr. Paul Levine preaches. Some people think that getting married just like going through a cafeteria. You pick out what looks good and then you pay later. <laughs> and that's the way a lot of them have found it out. Be mighty sure that boy or that girl is saved and living for God and loves God. And don't take any chances. Oh, but you say, it's all right for me to marry that unsaved girl, that unsaved boy, or that backslidden boy. Or that backslidden girl, ah, he's, he's saved. Oh, he cusses a little and drinks a little wine and smokes a little. But he's a nice guy. Oh, he doesn't stay for church on Sunday morning, runs home from Sunday school. But he's saved, and we're going to get married and uh, going to have a happy married life. You better be careful. You better obey God all the way, young people. For your good, do it. See? Situation ethics. It's going to work out for us because we love each other. You better be sure about that love business. Some couples have illicit sex before they get married, and you think it's smart because they get by with it. Nobody catches them. And of course, the, the law, if the law did catch them, wouldn't do anything about it, but Ma didn't catch us, Dad didn't catch us, the preacher didn't catch us, nobody caught us. And um, you know what they say? Well, it's all right for us to live like man and wife. Oh, it is. Don't you know the Bible says marriage is honorable and all? And the bed, the marriage bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Don't you know that? I know that. I know the Bible says that. Well, if you know the Bible says that, then why do you say it's all right for you to go to bed together? Well, you see, it's all right in our case because we're going to get married anyway. That's situation ethics. One time I was preaching in a very fine Baptist church, and I saw the choir coming in from over here. They were coming up into the choir loft, and I noticed that the associate pastor was standing right down there like he was watching for somebody. And there was a young couple in that church who had told me earlier that week, this was in January, they said, we're going to get married in June. Well, anyway, this associate pastor standing down there, and all of a sudden here came that young man who's going to get married, associate the associate pastor took him out of the line and whispered something in his ear. And when he did, the young man's head went down, bop, like some guy he bopped him on the head with a hammer. He just stood there with his, in shame and disgrace, standing with his head down. Just wait there. And so preacher gets back on guard duty again. <laughs> After a while, here comes the girl. Get out of the line. Whispered something to her, down on her head. Then I saw him point to these two, and he said, you go sit over there. He took them right out of the choir. Thank God for a church that's got some standards. Amen. You can't sing in our choir while you're living. I didn't know what was going on, see. I didn't know what was going on. But that night, I preached on the sin of fornication, the sin of illicit sex. And... Um, that's what they were guilty of, see. They were going to get married in June. And, well, we're going to get married anyhow. Why wait till June? Why not have each other now? Because the Bible's against it, that's why. The good reasons for it. And, uh, boy, I don't know how the preacher found out, but he found out, the associate found it out, and they found it out just in time to catch him before they went in the choir, and they nailed him with it and asked him point blank, are you guilty? And they both were caught in their sin, and they said, we are guilty. Then you don't sing in the choir. And they didn't. Now, I didn't know one thing was going on, but when I got through preaching that night, they both came forward, both got down on their knees and wept and wept and wept and wept over their sins, and I hope that they got right with God. Now, just one more word. Look. Saul's sin was the same sin you commit if you say, I won't go all the way with God. He tried to cover it up by bluffing and blaming and lying and saying it's all right in this case. Did he get caught? 
You always get caught in your sin. You always get caught. Boy, did you kill all the animals? Yes. About that time, and the preacher said, hey, what's that? Sound like some Texas steers around here. And some sheep, where they come from? And he's caught red-handed in his sin. He lied. He said, I kill all those animals. And there they are, bellering and bleeding. There they are. Young folks, someday, if you don't utterly destroy the sins that are going to destroy you, someday the cattle in your life will begin to low and the sheep will begin to bleat. And the skeletons in your life that you've got hidden away and you think nobody knows about will begin to rattle and the chickens will come home to roost. Wait till you get that venereal disease. Wait till you get pregnant. You never thought it was going to happen to you, but just as wait. Wait till something else happens. Did you know they got a camera now? They can fly in the dark and take a picture of a parking lot and take pictures of cars that were there during the day, but they're not there now? You say, I don't understand that. I don't either. But they can tell exactly where every car has been and how the length of it and the width of it and everything. From way up into space. And if men can do that, you can be sure God's got a camera, young people. And you can be sure, you can be sure that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro everywhere, beholding the good and the bad. Can anybody hide from God? Jeremiah asks, and in Genesis we read, Thou God seest me. So what's the answer? The answer, if you have never received Jesus Christ, is to receive him tonight and be saved. If you're not sure... Make sure. I've dealt with several people this week who didn't understand how you could know for sure you were saved. And I think they understand it now. And if you're a Christian and you belong to God like I believe Saul did, but you're not listening to God's voice through Samuel. You're not listening to God's voice through Dr. Bill III. You're not listening to God's voice through Ron Riley. You're listening to the voice of the people. And by listening to the voice of the people... Your enemies are going to converge on you and destroy you. But God says, destroy those enemies. Utterly, young people, utterly. What does it mean? It means you go home and smash every rock record you got. Get rid of all the dirty literature. Tear the pin-up pictures off the walls of your room. Get rid of the drugs. Have a real house cleaning. Have a meeting in your church where you say, hey, let's have a record-breaking meeting and have one and Bring all your records and smash them to pieces and throw them in the bonfire and bring in all the dirty books while you're at it and the cigarettes and the drugs and everything else and have a rootin', tootin', utterly destroying business to the glory of God. You'll be glad you did it. You'll be glad you did it. Otherwise, they're going to destroy you. Let me tell you about a man in the prime of life, 40 years old, Three times he's called me up and talked to me for an hour and a half. Daylight time. The last time he called me up from about a hundred and some miles away, he was crying. He said, Paul, I want to die. Don't want to live anymore. Don't want to live anymore. Isn't that awful? Forty years old. Man. Here's Dr. Bell at 30. He's not even 40 yet. Look how he's going. Great guns for God. And these other men. Ron, he's about 65 or 70, but Bill is third. He's a young fella yet. And I'm still young. Man, I got a lot of time ahead of me. But here's a guy only 40. And he has shot his life to pieces with liquor and women and drugs. Didn't bring him any peace. Didn't bring him any happiness. He wants to die. You know what he said to me? The last time he talked to me, he said, Paul, he said, I want to die, but I haven't got the guts to kill myself. Wouldn't that be an awful fix to be in? You don't want to live. You want to die. You could die if you take a gun and blow your brains out or slash your wrist or swallow some poison or some other way. You could die, but you haven't got what it takes to do it. So you got to live in your sorrow and in your misery and in your unhappiness. And here's a 40-year-old man who wept and cried and says, 
I want to die. Did you know that when he was in high school, he was smart enough to be an A, straight A student? And he went to a good church, just like you. And if folks would have gone to that church and seen that 15, 16-year-old boy, they said, man, look at that nice guy. He's sharp. He looked sharp. He was well-mannered. But then, all of a sudden, he got out with the wrong crowd. Then came the liquor, and then the tobacco, and the drugs, and all the rest of it. He has now shot his life. I wonder how God might have used him if he had behaved himself. Imagine what he might have been. He might have been preaching from up here or somewhere else. He's smart enough to be, to be a real servant of God. There's no chance, no chance, young people. Forty years of his life are gone. They'll never be back. There's nothing he can do about it. Now, you, let me tell you what, what, what happened. See, he professed to be saved, and he told me, he said, Paul, I've given up the liquor. But he says not the cigarettes. He didn't go all the way. He hung on to something. He didn't slay all the animals. He didn't slay King Agag. And because he didn't slay that king, tobacco, tobacco became his king. He said, I'll give up the booze. I won't give up the tobacco. He did not give up the tobacco. He went along and went back to the booze and back to the drugs. And you know what it was? He listened to the voice of the people. I went to see him one Saturday night. And when I got there, I was trying to get him to go to church on Sunday morning. But right at the very time that I came there, I was trying to get him to go to church Sunday morning, he was right then getting ready to go fishing with a bunch of boozers and smokers, and they were going down on the river, and they were going down there and fish and drink beer all night long and have a big binge. A big 200-pound man who was a moral weakling who listened to the voice of the people, blamed the people, shot his life to pieces. He is a nothing tonight. Don't let it happen to you. Let's bow in prayer. Thank you so very much for your listenership this week. I hope something that was said was a blessing and encouragement and exhortation to you. On behalf of the Bible Tracks Incorporated team, I'm evangelist Micah McCurry. We so greatly appreciate the fact that you would make this program part of your week. Have a great day for His glory. God bless. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Track Echoes a ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of all of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. That's 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. A faster way to contact us is to go to our website at BibleTracksInc.org. That's BibleTracksInc.org. There you will find more information about our ministry and details on how you can support Bible Tracks Incorporated. Thanks for listening, and may the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him. <music>